I want to encourage you tonight. So many beautiful words have been shared, so many wonderful things uh, I've been thinking from where we started on Thursday night uh, to all the words on Friday, Friday night. Uh, it wasn't a great night last night. There was such a wonderful presence of God, uh, such a freedom to minister, uh, n- not just from the front, but everywhere it was taking place. God's presence was just here. Uh, and then just the, the sweet morning this morning. And, uh, and here we are. I can't believe that it's almost the end tomorrow morning. We, we, we're finishing off and we're going home. But it's been a good time. It's been a good time. I feel refreshed. I feel encouraged. Um, just the different angles and the different things that have happened. And so tonight, all I want to do is encourage you, you know, on this way, on this journey of advancing the kingdom of God. So, and, and just encourage you and tell you that I, I kind of said on the, on the journey of advancing the kingdom of God, there are three things that you need to remember. That's what I want to share with you tonight. I want you to know that God will change you. Sometimes God will change your circumstance. And other times you will change nothing and still do it. I'm going to share that with you tonight. I want to take three people out of the Word tonight and just maybe, um, and hope that you'll find yourself there so that as you leave here, because, you know, the big deal about this thing is when you are in a safe environment like this, amongst a whole lot of good Christians that are encouraging you, wonderful stories that we hear, uh, we get all pumped up and excited, and then it's Monday. Uh, And then we face life and reality and challenges. And I want to say to you, in the context of that, as we pursue that which God has assigned us to, as we get busy with that which God is doing within and through us and always say without us, um, it is important to remember that God is willing to change you. He's willing to change your circumstance. And other times He's not going to change a thing and still do, and still do it. Um, I heard somebody said not too long ago, it's important that you, we understand that God needs us. And when we talk about the fact that God needs us, the first thing that we know is that God doesn't need anything. God doesn't need anything. God is perfect. Uh, There's nothing. God doesn't need to change anything because if God needs to change anything, he, He should change Himself and He doesn't need to change Himself because He's the best. He is perfect and wonderful. So God doesn't need anything or anybody. But God chooses to need us. He chooses to include us in the process and in the journey. And then we need to face ourselves. Uh, The important thing about God needing us, as I said, that He doesn't need us because He doesn't need anything. He chooses to need us. And then we need to choose to be connected and to be used by Him. And in the process of that, uh, we face these three realities. That there are times that I need things to change uh, around me. Some things that need to change about me. And then I've realized, even in recent days, there are times that God's not going to change anything. He's not going to change me, nor my circumstance. He's just going to do it. And allow me to share that with you tonight um, out of three portions of Scripture. The first one is out of uh, First Chronicles, uh, a story about an amazing young man um, called Jabez. First Chronicles chapter 4, I want to read you just one or two verses. And, you know, sometimes in life things can go terribly wrong and, uh, and, and it doesn't work out. And, and we can get bitter and, and negative and full of self-pity. Um, but when we, when we choose to approach life God's way and from His angle and see it the way He sees it, He can make it sweet. He can change our circumstance and our situation, that which we go through in a wonderful way. And and here's a story about an amazing man. If you read the the chapter 4 of Chronicles, it is just a story of genealogy. All these names, name upon name upon name coming through. This one was begot by this one that belonged to this one that gave birth to that one. And then you get to verse 9. And all of a sudden it changes and there's a, a bit of a description of a young man called Jabez. And and this is what it says. It says, let me just get there. It says, Jabez was honorable above his brothers, but his mother named him Jabez, or sorrow maker, saying, because I bore him in pain. Jabez cried to God of Israel, saying, oh, that you would bless me, enlarge my border, and that you, 
and that your hand might be with me and that you would keep me from evil so that it might not hurt me. And God granted him a request. When you look at the story of Jabez, you find a guy, all of a sudden, the Bible changes in, when it gets to this part of Jabez. It says that Jabez um, was an honorable man. He, first of all, his name was not such a great name. So I don't know about you, but sometimes I bump into people who have great names but live miserable lives. You, you know, they, they, they have got this amazing name like Alexander, conqueror of men. And they can't conquer their backyards. And then I've got people that I meet sometimes. They haven't got such great names, but they live great lives. Have you, have you been? You know, a name is a powerful thing. It's got a prophetic meaning. It calls you forth. It declares something about you, over you, uh, and, and, and supposed to propel you into your destiny. And, and here's a young man that is kind of born in a situation, and his mother calls his name Pain. Kind of that, you know, it says he was born in pain, but I can just imagine because his name meant that, that the buddies at school called him, Hey, pain. I don't know pain where, pain in the neck, pain, but the pain. I'm sure that Reuben will explain to us in a different way where the pain is. But anyway, he was a pain. He had a kind of a, a, a different name, a name that wasn't so exciting to hear. I, have you ever had somebody call you a name? Or you're a religious one, or you're this one, or you're stupid, or you're silly, or you're just a nothing or a nobody. And you know what's the most amazing thing? When life doesn't work out the way we want it, we start calling sometimes ourselves names. We, we, the devil kind of wants us to go by another name. He doesn't want us to go by the name that God is calling us for. He doesn't want us to, to, to be a people of faith or a people of confidence. And I want to just talk for a little bit and for a little while. Uh, even if you know what the real meaning of your physical name is, there's a spiritual name of destiny and purpose that God's calling you. There's, there's something that God is, is placing on you, in you, uh, and over you that He wants to call you forth in as a man and a woman of purpose and destiny. As somebody that will advance the kingdom of God. And sometimes when circumstance is not what we wanted and we kind of get born into a situation, we kind of think maybe it's not possible for me. And Jabez was kind of born into a situation like that where things were not so great for him and his mother called him man who cause, a man who causes sorrow or pain. One of the most amazing things about this young guy, you know, I've heard people, I've, I know people that have, have gone to home affairs and changed their names because they didn't like their name. They've gone to home affairs and changed their name. Their life is still the same. Nothing has changed about them except for the fact that their ID says that they've got a new name. But the most amazing thing about Jabez is that he never went to home affairs to change his name. He went to God to change him. He never went to home affairs. He never went to somebody to change his name. He just went to God. The Bible says that in spite of the circumstance that he experienced, the name that they called him, the, the nicknames uh, that the friends might have called him, what he have felt and experienced, and kind of the, 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 the uncertainty and inferiority that he might have had in his, in his heart, that why would I be called this? The Bible says that he, has, he was honorable above his brothers. Jabez made a choice that regardless of his circumstance, regardless of who he was and what he was called, that he was going to believe in God, that he was going to honor God, and he's going to walk with God. He lived a positive life in spite of his circumstance. And then it says here, he took action. Jabez took action, not moaning and groaning, not feeling sorry for himself, not wondering why he looked the way he looked or the way why his mother called him what she called him. He went to God and was determined to fulfill his purpose and his destiny. He went to God. And the Bible says, if, if you, I'm going to mention three people. One is Jabez, who means sorrow maker or bore in pain, or one who caused pain. The other one is just a woman. The Bible called her just a woman. Just a no-name woman tell you just now why. The other one is a man with a PhD degree in theology, Paul. And these people are experiencing things on their journey 
in fulfilling their God given, because everybody is born in the image and the likeness of God. Everybody was made for a purpose. Everybody was designed so that they could give God glory, bring Him glory, and fulfill their God given purpose. And as you sit here tonight, you know, I was so blessed by that interview that I could have with those uh, young men, uh, young man and woman this morning in their honesty in their journey. That it doesn't matter what the enemy calls them or at times what they call themselves or what the world calls them. They were determined to call out to God to find their purpose and destiny. And Jabez is calling out to God. All three of these people, as you read these portions of Scripture, the one thing that they had in common is they went to God and they called out to God. They were not casually asking from God. They were not just consulting God. The Bible says they were earnestly calling out to God so that that which they struggle with, he could change. And the Bible says as he, with great determination and commitment and persuasion, called out to God, he asked him for four things. First thing is he said, God, will you bless me? This man that is supposed to not make it, causing pain. He says, Lord, I want you to bless me. I want you to bless me regardless of what people say about me, regardless of what they think about me. And I want to say this to you. You know, when we read in Genesis, that's God's intention for our lives. Did you know that? When God made man, it says he blessed them, told them to multiply, and said to them to have dominion over the earth. As you sit here tonight, whether you know that or not, you're blessed. And God wants you to walk in the blessing and the favor of of Almighty God and the favor that He has intended for your life, regardless of your circumstance. The second thing that He asked, He said this, He says, Lord, will you enlarge my border? Now, I've heard many sermons and, and preachings in and around that, but I want to say this to you and just want to make a suggestion to you tonight. As then when He says enlarge my borders, the word border means restriction or restrain or limitation. And, and, and Jabez was not going to live by the limitation, the restriction, or the border, or the boundary placed on him. And that people would speak over him. You know, I don't know about you, but there are times in my life that the worst enemy in my life is called me. I, I, I know me. And I always say, if you know me like I know me, you won't be my friend. But that's okay, because if I know you like you know you, I won't be your friend either. So let's be friends. But sometimes I just know some things about me that, that I might do certain things and, and people might be excited with me, about, but there's certain things that I, I battle to push into new places and over certain lines and, and, and further into what God's got for me because I know me. And sometimes I think things about me. I might not even say it. How many of you know what I'm talking about? I just might not even say it, but I think it. I think maybe I'm Jabez. I might think that I can't, or I'm not sure that that will do it, or that will work. And, and, and God, and Jabez, instead of calling himself and feeling sorry for himself, all kinds of names, he went to God and he says, God, take away this limitation, this restriction, this boundary that, that the world, that people, that circumstance, and even myself have placed on me and extend it for me. I want to say to you tonight, God wants you to call out because He wants to take certain limitations off you. He will put your boundary in the right place for you, but He wants to extend it, and He wants to expand it, and He wants to take you into new places. But He was a smart young man. He prayed this. He says, Lord, do not just extend my boundary. He prays a prayer out of deep sincerity when He says, uh, in deep sincerity when He said, but lead me in the way. You know, there's a scripture in Romans chapter 11. I read it the first night, verse 36. I think Edna quoted it this morning as well. That everything is from God, through God, and to God. Through Him comes and goes everything. He was saying, Lord, on this journey of you helping me to fulfill my kingdom purpose, in you enlarging my, 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 my space and my boundaries, I want you to help me not just to ask you for a breakthrough, but I want to do it with you. Can I give you an encouragement tonight? Can I motivate you tonight that when you hear your call and when you hear God's assignment or His mandate for your life, don't try and do it on your own. Make sure that He's with you and that you are with Him all the way. Not just that, 
Make sure, listen to what he says in his next request. He says, stay with me, Lord, all the days of my life. Help me that I will not just aim for a success, not just to, to have the restrictions and the limitations on my life being removed so that I can have what I have and I can do what I want to do. He says, well, stay with me in this journey. Be with me. Lead me and guide me. And then he says this in verse 10. Listen, he says, and Lord, help me. He says, that your hand will be with me and that you would keep me from evil so it might not hurt me. He says, not just only want, uh, do I want you to remove the restrictions and, and, and extend where I'm going. I want you to be with me. Not just do I want you to be with me, God. I want you to help me to remember where I come from, where I got it, who I got it from, so that I will always point back to you. Don't let me get to a place where because you help me, that I get to a place of success and it brings pride or arrogance, where it brings the independence, where, where, where that which I do is pointing to me or pointing to the work that I'm doing instead of, instead of pointing to you. He says, I want you to extend my boundaries. I want you to be with me and I want you to help me to always point people back to you. You know what the end of the verse is? God gave it to him. Isn't that amazing? Just because he was honorable. What does that mean? He just chose to, in spite of his circumstance and his situation, to say, I choose to believe that God can change me. Whatever you call me, whatever I was born into, whatever it is that, I, that, that has happened to me, what people think about me, I'm not going to let that limit me. And God changed a man. Never changed his name, changed him. Amen? God wants you to know tonight, it doesn't matter what you think about yourself, doesn't matter what people say about you, what education you've got or haven't got, what you think you can't do. When God calls you for something, He's going to change you, He's going to adjust you and reshape you so that you can do that which He's called you for. Second one is a woman. The Bible calls her a Canaanite woman. I want you to go with me to Matthew chapter 15. What's the time? We okay? Matthew 15, 21. And going away from there, Jesus withdrew to the district of Tyre and Sidon and built a woman. It doesn't call a woman a name. It doesn't say who she was. It just calls her a Canaanite woman. A woman who was a Canaanite from the district came out with a loud, troublesome, urgent cry. Listen, not a casual seeking or searching or just a, a, a conversation, but an urgent cry, a begging. Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. My daughter is miserably and distressingly and cruelly possessed by a demon. This woman is in a crisis. She has got a circumstance with her, around her, that she lives with on a daily basis. And the Bible says the urgency and the degree of her circumstance that she lives in and with causes her to run out to Jesus and scream out and shout and say, I cannot live with this anymore. Please help me. And the Bible says that he did not answer her a word. It's quite a strong statement, isn't it? It doesn't say that Jesus didn't answer her. He didn't say to her a word, the Bible says. He didn't answer her a word. That means he didn't even say to her, I'll talk to you later. Just give me five minutes. I'm just busy with something. Just give me something to think. I'm just going to pray quickly. I'll, I'll get back to you just now. The Bible says he did not answer her a word. And his disciples came because she was determined and she refused to stop. The Bible says the disciples came and implored him saying, send her away for she is crying out after us. It's not Jesus that keeps people away from the church. It's normally his disciples. 
We do not know what to do with people that shout and scream and are desperate. We do not know what to do with people that are determined and, um, and have got some issues and problems and don't want to quiet down or, or, or tone down their voices. Uh, it's normally the church that, that don't know what to do with people that are different and, and otherwise and behaving differently. And the Bible says that all they wanted to do is get rid of her. And he answered, and then he answered her. When, 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 when they wanted to get rid of her, he answered, and I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But she came and kneeling, worshipped him and kept praying, Lord, help me. I want to say to you, the second thing I want to talk to you about tonight is about a woman. And, and I believe that God just said a woman, and, and, and I don't want to get into the whole why the Canaanite, they were not very... Uh, uh, accepted by the people of God at that time and day that they live in. And she was a, a somebody. And, and God wants to say to a somebody here tonight that I want to change your circumstance. You don't have to settle for what you're in because God cares about you and where you find yourself and is prepared to change that for you. But there's an important thing that we need to hear and see and learn from this woman tonight. First of all, uh, I want to say to you, there are times when we call out to God and we don't get an answer immediately. We, we, we don't hear God straight away. And it's important that we don't get disheartened, dis, all the disses that ate us, disappointed. It's, it's important that we don't give up. Because there's a reason why God sometimes don't speak. There's a reason why God sometimes is quiet. I remember another story in the Bible that, that also somebody came out to him and said, will you please come quickly because my brother Lazarus is sick. And the Bible says because Jesus loved him so much, he stayed away for four days. And then the lesson that we need to get out of why God sometimes does not answer us straight away is simply for this, later is greater. He, he wanted Lazarus to experience and the people to experience the full glory of God. And sometimes God doesn't answer you straight away because later is greater. The second reason why he doesn't always answer us is because he wants us to go back to the last time he spoke to us. You know, there are times in my life that I want God to say a new thing to me or say something fresh to me or, or, or tell me something that I haven't heard before and I'm not getting anything from him except that when I wait long enough, Go back to the last time I spoke to you. I, I prayed for somebody once. Um, I was in a conference in Durban, and a gentleman came up to me and said, I haven't heard God for, for ages. He said, it's just like God doesn't want to speak to me. I, I think I spoke on, about hearing the voice of God. And that night as I laid hands on him and waited and didn't know what to pray and what to say to him, I felt the Holy Spirit said to me, tell him to do what I told him a month ago to do. And I told him that, and he started crying. He said to me, I didn't think that's really what I would like to do. I said, that's what God would like you to do. And the reason why you haven't heard his voice is because you haven't done what he told you the last time to do. Sometimes these things are so simple, you need somebody else to help you to misunderstand it. I want to say to you tonight that God wants not just to change things in you so that you could be fully you in the context of who he created you to be not for self but for him to fulfill his kingdom purpose to to be to become the person that is designed you to be to advance his kingdom he also wants to change your circumstance so that you could live above it beyond it and free from it the third reason why he didn't answer straight away is because sometimes God wants us to be determined not just to get what we want, but to break through in what He's called us for. He said to her, it's not good for me to give the bread of the children of Israel to the dogs. That's a quite a strong statement. Whichever way you read it, theologians debate about what it exactly meant. And how we approach to some people don't like to preach about it. Well, that was quite a strong statement. But you know what's an amazing thing about this? 
that she does not allow any statement or anything being said stopping her from getting what she wants. Sometimes God wants to see whether we will seek Him and push through for Him because I don't know about you, but sometimes I'm just comfortable in some of my misery. I, I don't always want to break through. I sometimes just want things to be better. Have you ever been in a place like that? Sometimes I'm just happy with what I'm experiencing in and around my life. I just want things to be better because I, I don't want God to answer me too radically or too strongly. I don't want God to tell me too many radical things in case I have to do some radical things. And God's silent because He's looking for somebody that says, I will seek you and I will knock until you open. So, so my question tonight to you is, how do you handle it when God's silent? Do you understand that sometimes later is greater? Have you gone back to the last time that He's spoken to you? And how do you handle silence, rejections, and a little bit of insult or offense? Because if the devil could get any of those things into your head and mind and say God is not interested in you, he doesn't want to speak to you, he'll get you off track so quickly that by Wednesday you'll be depressed and need another conference. The Bible says in verse 25, this and this, but she came kneeling, worshipped him, and kept praying. Can you see her attitude? Can you see this woman's attitude? This, this unknown woman that nobody knew and didn't like and the disciples tried to get away from Jesus and away from her kingdom purpose. The Bible said she, she knelt down. Her posture was humble. Her attitude was that of humility. Her heart was that of a worshiping heart that said, I refuse to get offended with God. I refuse to let some Christian disciples put me off track and say to me, I don't belong here and I shouldn't be here. I'm going to keep on worshiping Jesus. There's things that the devil will try to do to you through people, through church, through circumstance, through situation to get you off worshiping God. He wants to get you. Reuben shared this morning, I got offended with God. I got offended with the church. You know, and we understand that we need to reach out to people when they get hurt. But listen, don't get offended. Don't allow the devil to get you there to a place where you don't break through because of circumstance, situation, or what people say to you. The Bible says she knelt down. She was humble. She kept on worshiping, and she kept on praying. I want to show you a most powerful prophetic apostolic prayer. Lord, help me. That's all she prayed. Lord, help me. She didn't rebuke things, cast things out. She didn't go berserk. She just was sincere in her heart and say, Lord, help me. I don't know about you, but there are times in my life that I've prayed every scripture. I confessed it. I put my name in there. I put my wife's name in there. I put the church name in there. I spoke to God. I spoke to the devil. I spoke to myself. I spoke to circumstance and nothing changed. And then sometimes I just fall on my face and say, Lord, Jesus, help me. And he does. God wants to help you tonight. Simple word tonight. Very simple. There's something in you that God wants to shift tonight and change tonight so that you can leave here. And if it was not on camera, if it was not recorded, that you will not leave as a Jabez. I would have said something else. But that you could leave the man or the woman that God's intended you to be, regardless of what society, friends, Saved, unsaved, or anybody calls you because God says, I'll change it for you. Extend your boundaries. Remove your restrictions. Bless you and grant you what you didn't think you could get. Because I've made you for my kingdom. Number two, God says, there are certain circumstances that is holding you back, that is manipulating your life, that is holding you in chains, that is stopping you from moving forward with the freedom and the liberty that you need to move with. And I'm powerful enough to destroy that, break that off you, and release you so that you can do what you're supposed to do. But when you don't hear, and when you don't see it immediately, don't get despondent, discouraged, and don't give up. The third one is Paul. Oh, by the way, it says... In verse 25, 
But she came, kneeling, worshipped him, kept praying, and Lord, Lord, help me. And he answered, it is not right. He tells her the whole story about the little dogs. And then verse 28, it says, then Jesus answered her, O woman, great is your faith. Be it done for you as you wish. And her daughter was cured from that moment. Third one is Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 7. Paul is writing, he says, and to keep me from being puffed up and too much elated by the exceeding greatness and preeminence of these revelations, there was given to me a thorn, a splinter in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to rack and buffet and harass me, to keep me from being excessively exalted. Three times I called, listen, three times I called upon the Lord and besought him about this and begged him that it might depart from me. But he said to me, my grace, my favor and my loving kindness and mercy is enough for you. Sufficient against any danger and enables you to bear the trouble manfully, manfully. For my strength and power are made perfect, fulfilled and completed and show themselves most effectively in your weakness. Therefore I will all the more gladly glory in my weakness and infirmities that the strength and power of Christ the Messiah may rest, yes, may pitch a tent over the, and dwell upon me. Isn't that powerful? Paul is an experienced campaigner. Paul is committed. Paul loves God. Paul has had experiences with Jesus, with the Holy Spirit. Paul moves in signs and wonders walks at a level of phenomenal revelation with God. And he gets to a place where he feels that there are certain restrictions in his life. I don't think this was a sickness or a disease. It's just a messenger for, for, from Satan. Because I know that God doesn't try to stop us or direct us through sickness and disease. He's conquered that on the cross. But there's a resistance. There, there, there's something happening in Paul's life where he feels that he's losing control. He wants to be problem free. He wants all that money that he needs to do that next project. He wants the great team with him so that everybody is with him on the same level of revelation, the same level of commitment, determination, and focusness. People that do things the way he would do it. People that understand that kingdom culture. People that know how to function and walk with him. That are positive, full of faith. He wants teams like that. And there's somebody around him that's not like that. There's somewhere some money shortage. There's somewhere somebody that is not going with the flow the way he wants it to and there's a resistance and he thought, God, if you could just take some of these thorns in my flesh out of the way. If you could just give us all the money right now, we can do this project. If you would just give me the right team right now, God, it will be easy because there's a few people that irritate me and people are not fully with me and I just need a few good leaders around me. We can do this thing. Lord, there, there's a, if you just give us that facility, it's been standing there empty. It's an unsaved, uh, um, uncircumcised Philistine. He's got it. If you could just talk to him quickly and just hand the building over or the facility over, we'll be A for away, God. Lord, I'm not fully in control. I'm not fully in charge the way I would like to be. And you know you've spoken to me. You've given me vision. You've given me prophetic insight. You've given me an apostolic mandate. I know where I'm going. And if you could just take a few of these silly things out of the way, we can get there quickly. And God says to him, Paul, I'm not going to do it. My grace is sufficient for you. The grace of God's amazing. You know, I've, I've recently discovered afresh the grace of God. I, I've been struggling with some things. I've, I've, I've walked through a season where I couldn't understand where, why so many of the things that we've been promised by God, amazing prophetic words, in certain areas on the brink of breakthrough, hovering at certain places at, 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 in situations where we just know it's, it's just like one step away from, from something radical and awesome happening, and yet it's just not happening. 
times where, where we want to do things and we know as a leadership or eldership that, that God has kind of said to us, yes, you, you can pursue that development. That land has been given and, and an agreement that we should do things, but we just can't do it. We, we just can't seem to take that one step where, uh, where, where, where it's just flowing. And frustration begins to build up. And, I, and you know, you look around and you, you blame the economy or sometimes you blame people that are not giving or people that are not... F- faithing it with you, or people that are not leading with you the way they should, and you just want certain things to adjust and change, and, and it doesn't. And then you, you fall on your face and you think there's something wrong with you. God, there's something wrong with me. Maybe I'm not leading well enough, or maybe I'm not really strong enough, or maybe I'm not leading gentle enough. Well, what is it that I'm doing wrong? God says, no, you're fine. And then you try to pr- change the circumstance, and God's not changing. And He says to you, My grace, the, the grace of God is not just something that saves us when we're in trouble. The grace of God is Christ, it is God's answer to our problem. It is God coming in the form of His Son to pay the full price in something and for something that we don't deserve at all, and it does not allow us to have any share in it, but to receive it. When God says, by my grace, He says, I'm doing it all by myself. So that you will know that there is nothing that you can do to get this. Otherwise, it is your righteousness. It is your effort. It is what you think the right thing is to do. It comes through your... Co- I was standing in Australia after I'd just gone to visit my son and attended a conference there and just spent some time with friends over there. And I was standing in their home the one morning and I said, God, why is it that we are just not breaking through? Why is it that we are just always on that edge, but we're just not there? We, we just, just a few small things. You've, you've done some great things in the past and, and yet we're stuck with small things right now. Right there as I was standing in the shower, talking with God through my thoughts, brushing my teeth. It's amazing how God can engage with us when we are not standing on our knees or we're not walking the floor, shandai, rondai, tie my bow tie kind of thing, you know. Resisting devils and demons, proclaiming things, declaring things, quoting scriptures. We're just kind of brushing our teeth, thinking prayers to God. And I said, God, why is it that it's not happening? And God, I felt the Spirit of God said to me, how did you get here? I said, I I got you by your goodness and your grace. He said, what makes you think that you're going to get further any other way? I I said, no, I know. I I know there's no other way. And God said to me, so what are you doing? I said, no, I'm doing nothing. I'm just committed. And I'm faithful. And I'm a good son. And I'm a good leader. And I'm determined, God, and I want to keep the people excited because, you know, we're going through difficult times and the economy is bad and people are oppressed and depressed and I'm, I'm encouraging them and motivating them and I, and I want to speak faith in, to them and I want to declare things over them and, I, and I wanna, I'm determined. And God said to me, you're right, you know, you are determined, you are committed, you are faithful, and you're a good leader. God doesn't even tell me that I'm a bad leader. Can you imagine that? He tells me he loves me. He says, but the quicker you call your determination, your commitment, and your faithfulness, self-righteousness, dead works, and pride, the quicker you and I can move on. I said, God, me? I'm, hum- I'm humble, God. I know that I got you just by your grace. And, and, and then I got explained it a little bit to God because I think sometimes <laughs> God doesn't ex- ex- understand everything exactly the way he should. And, and maybe he was busy at a certain time when I, I was busy with that. I said to him, God, um, I, I'm 56 now. Surely by now I should know certain things and understand certain things and, and know how to apply some of these wonderful principles and I'm, I'm I don't have to lie fall down and lie over and just take it the way it comes I'm, I'm, I'm determined and I'm committed and I'm and I'm faithful and I'm trying to motivate your people here 
And I heard the Holy Spirit say to me, the quicker you could call it self-righteousness, dead works, and pride, the quicker you and I can move on. Because if you're not, you're going to get more determined, more committed, more faithful, and more loyal. And whatever you give more is not going to do it for you. I said, God, there's just a few small thorns that you just need to remove your God. You, you, I mean, I'm ready. I know I've got, there are five prophetic words that are so prominent. I know exactly what you said. I know exactly what you're going to do. Uh, Lord, I know exactly. I'm a kingdom man. The word even says in John 16, it says, I will give you my spirit. He will le- live in you, will lead and guide you in all truth. And he will show you things to come. I, I know the things that are coming. I, I'm excited, God. It's to me you don't know. And you can't get you there. And you can't get the church there. You can't pray the church there. You can't motivate the church there. You can't convince the church there. You can't prophesy the church there. You will only get there by my grace. And I said, but don't you want to share some of the stuff with me? And he said to me, no. I said, what must I tell the people? He says, just tell them I don't know. I said, but I'm the leader. He says, I know, but you don't know. (laughs) And that's the way it's going to be. Because every time that you do it out of what you think it's right, and you think you should have the answer every time, it becomes self-righteousness. And self-righteousness is dead works. And if you keep on doing your self-right act again and again, and dead works uh, Continue again and again. That becomes pride when you don't want to stop and, and step back, son. And you know what? I wish I could explain to you what happened to me that moment when I dared to just listen to that scripture that Paul quotes to the Galatians when he said to the Galatians, Oh, you foolish Galatians. What made you think that you could start in the spirit and end up in your own right way? Keep on doing it and cause dead works and fall into a place of pride where you think you could just keep on doing it and end up in the flesh again. And you know what shocked me? That the devil deceived me with the sincerity of my own heart. That this desire that I have to see the kingdom of God come in Jeffrey's Bay, this desire that I have to see churches being planted, Community projects being established, the name of the Lord being proclaimed, the glory of God in our city, the people of God being empowered, that the sincerity of my heart became the deception and the lie that the enemy trapped me with. And I had to get to a place where I realized there are times that God will change Louis else. That, that when I think I can't, when I call myself names, and I know you don't know it, but sometimes you at least think it. And you put limitations on yourself. And I'm not talking about horrible names. I'm just talking about maybe that's not what I can do or supposed to do. Or maybe, maybe I'm pushing too far. Or maybe I'm just not made for this. Or, and God says, no, 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 no. I'm going to take that limitation off you, son. I'm going to take the restriction off. I'm going to grace you and I'm going to anoint you because I've got a plan for you. And I'm not going to ask you what you think the plan is. I'm telling you what the plan is. Wow. I never thought I could do that. God says, by my grace, you'll do that. There are other times where, where circumstance so overpower me that I thought it's just not possible for that to change. Have you ever had a thought like that? It's just the thing that you've been praying about for days and weeks and months and sometimes years and sometimes you just don't hear from God. And every time I want to give up, God says, no, come on now, pray, man. Push into this whole thing. Don't let that little demon overcome you so quickly. Later is greater, son. I'm going to do a great thing for you here. Come on now, push in there. And I knock and we push in and people pray with us and believe with us and stand with us and wow. Devils fly and demons leave. And then there are times that I come out of that thing and I say, do you know who I am? I'm Jabez. I cast out devils and demons. And then a little thorn, a little thorn just messed my life up. And I said, come on, God, we can do this thing. And God says, we are not going to do it, son. I'm going to do it. I'm going to do certain things with you, certain things in you, certain things through you, and other things just without you. And if you don't have that perspective and understanding, you'll get despondent, disheartened, and discouraged. All the disses that Edna spoke about this morning. 
You know, I don't know what we were going to do tonight. And I was wrestling with this word tonight. But I really believe God said, that's all I want to say to my people. Because I don't want you to leave in such a high and with such an excitement. And that by Monday, that you think God can't change you. That by Wednesday, some devil or demon that's holding you down somewhere by your ankle or in your business or in the church or at your household. Or sometimes when you get back with all the kids. That you think it's impossible. This can't change. God says, I'm going to change it for you. And the other times that you get overexcited and overenthusiastic and you think because you're called and because you've got a purpose and God must do it through you and he's, he, he just needs to remove a few. And God says, no, I'm not going to do it through you. I'm going to just send somebody from out there and my righteousness, the way that I think, listen, my righteousness, the way that I think is right for this circumstance or for this situation, I will appoint, we've just recently had a situation where we were challenged uh, uh, and there were so many opportunities where we could speak what we know is right. And God said to me, you will not say a word. And even eventually at, at one of the, I thought, God, we just can't carry on like this. Somebody needs to say something. I'm going to, maybe we need, I remember that night I made a note and I wanted to see some of my elders and some of the leaders. And I said, guys, maybe it's just time for us to say something. And one of our leaders came to me and he said, did you see this letter? I said, no, what letter is this? He says, this is a pastor from another church. They're not even charismatic. They're not into renewal. They wrote a letter on our behalf. To address the issue. God says, that's my righteousness on your behalf. So that you don't have to fight it. So that you don't have to defend yourself. So that not even when you write, sound self-righteous. There's just times that I want to do it my way, by my grace. So that I will get the glory. And tonight, you know what? I want to say to you that God's got a plan for all of us. God wants to adjust things. Not just around us. Because you know one of the biggest hurdles in life is not the assignment nor the vision. Nor what we suppose or what we should accomplish. Many times the problem is right here. The biggest hurdle, the biggest restriction I've found over the years is never God. God always allows me to dream much bigger than what I would ever think, ask or imagine. I've realized over the years that the devil is not the problem. I've made him at times the problem and had to realize again and again and again he's not the problem. Because I read some scriptures that say something like this, and Jesus made a show of them publicly triumphing over them in it. Every demon, every principality, every power, every big shot spirit that you can shout, call or name or try to show its face or blow its bad breath in your, in your nostrils. Jesus made a show of it. And when I align with God and I stay with Him and I do what He tells me to do because He's conquered it in the name of Jesus, I can conquer where He's placed me. We have faced principalities. We have faced demons. But because I know God planted us, because I know I'm aligned with God, I'm apostolically aligned, I'm aligned with leadership around me, and I'm aligned with the vision that God has given us, we have seen victories, and we have conquered things in the name of Jesus by His grace that I never thought was possible. I realize God's not the issue and the problem. He wants you and me to go places where we could never imagine for ourselves. I know devils and demons are not because Jesus has dealt, for, dealt with it. I know that people had no right to stop us because they're not the Lord of our lives. I've come to understand that the biggest problem in my life most of the time is me. The way I walk, the way I pray, the way I believe, the way I talk and walk, the way I... I align myself or don't align, my, align myself. The way I respond when I don't get the answer that I want at the time that I want it. When I get some thorn in my flesh and I, and I try to deal with it and, and do it my way. I realize most of the time I'm my problem. And that's why this word might not be so important to you, but it's important to me. Because I say, God, I want you to keep on changing me so that I can allow you to stretch the boundaries, remove the limitations, and walk into what you've got for me in the right perspective. I want to walk where Paul says, he says, don't think of yourself more highly than what you ought to. 
I'm not talking about self-promotion. I'm not talking about self-confidence. I'm talking about God's design and purpose for your life. I'm talking about walking in that place of humility that Jabez did. Lord, I don't want to do this thing on my own. I want to do it with you. Paul, Paul had the revelation of that. He says, in you I live and move and have my being. I don't do this thing outside of you. And when I get to the end result, may it always point back to you. That's the Jabez change I want. Secondly, I, I want you, there are certain circumstances that God says, I'm going to remove it so that you can move freely and boldly and confidently because this is not about what you want and don't want. It's about my kingdom advancing. And I want to create space and I want to advance it and I want to establish it. And I'm going to remove some circumstance for you. And lastly, there are certain things that you need to get out of the way with. Four. So I can do what I, I can do best without you. By my grace and by my power. Amen.